year is 1951. Six Tibetan delegates have arrived in Beijing. The scene is very tense. Just months ago, communist China had invaded Tibet. Their army was on a rampage, but suddenly they wanted to talk. The Tibetans had no chance on the battlefield, so they thought, why not? That's how the delegation arrived in Beijing. But once there, China's plan was clear. There was no agenda to discuss, no plan to debate. There was only a document to sign, this one, called the 17-point agreement. It would formally bring Tibet under China's control. Put yourself in the shoes of those Tibetan delegates. Your land is being plundered by China, your people are being harassed, and you find yourself in Beijing, the enemy's den. What would you do? Would you refuse to sign and risk your life, or live to fight another day? The Tibetans chose option two. They thought the agreement seemed fair. So on the 23rd of May, 1951, the 17-point agreement was signed. Tibet was formally annexed by China. But our story does not end in 1951. In fact, it doesn't even begin in 1951. On either side of this date is a long and complicated history. Time for a flashback. Tibet's geography is like no other. You will see high mountains, plateaus, rivers and lakes. And it's huge. Tibet's area is around 1.2 million square kilometers, but very few people live there, just around 3.5 million as of 2020. Tibet was first inhabited around 5,000 years ago. The first kings belonged to the Yarlung dynasty. Very little is known about them. Some even think they're mythical. So let's fast forward to the 7th century. That's when the Tibetan Empire was formed. During this time, China was ruled by the Tang dynasty. Both of them coexisted as neighbors. But in 670, the peace broke. China and Tibet would fight for the next two centuries. And don't think this was a one-sided contest. Tibet back then was pretty strong. They briefly captured China's imperial capital. But two centuries is a long time to fight. So they signed a peace treaty in the year 821. You can find the text engraved here on a pillar in Lhasa's Jokhang Temple. What did the treaty say? That Tibetans shall be happy in Tibet and the Chinese shall be happy in China. It wasn't to be. Over the next centuries, many invaders came. The Mongols, the Ming dynasty, the Qing dynasty, the British, and Tibet had a different relationship with each. It was during this time that the Dalai Lama emerged. The year was 1578, a Mongol ruler, Altan Khan, made the declaration. He declared Sonam Gyatso as the Dalai Lama. Now, Sonam Gyatso was a Buddhist leader. He belonged to the Gelugpa school of Buddhism. His successors would hold two roles. One was the spiritual head of Tibet, and second was political head. Among the Dalai Lamas, the fifth one was very powerful. They called him the Great Fifth. He took power in 1642. Just two years later, a new dynasty captured the throne of China, the Qing dynasty. In 1652, the Great Fifth visited China. The Qing emperor was in awe. He gifted him a golden album and a golden seal. He also proclaimed him as the Dalai Lama. And this relationship was important for both sides. But what was the nature of this relationship? That's a question that still haunts Tibet. China says Tibet was effectively a province, sort of like a vassal state of China. But Tibet disagrees. They say it was friendly relations between two independent states. This setup continued until the 20th century. That's when the British entered the picture, and that sentence usually means trouble for all parties. And that's exactly what happened. In 1906, China struck a deal with Britain. What did it say? That China has suzerainty over Tibet. Now, suzerainty is a bit complicated. It means control, but not full control. This treaty gave confidence to the Chinese. They tried to annex Tibet for the first time in 10 centuries. The Dalai Lama ended up fleeing to India. But China's imperial ambitions did not last. In 1911, the revolution broke out. The Chinese threw out the Qing dynasty, the Tibetans threw out the Chinese. Tibet was independent again, but then came the communists. In 1949, Mao Zedong captured power in China. He wanted Tibet. Mao's plan had two parts. First, try politically. If that fails, attack. On the 1st of January, 1950, China declared sovereignty over Tibet. Their message was quite clear, accept our rule or prepare for war. But Tibet did not give in. They maintained their old position. 
that Tibet and China had a priest-patron relationship, meaning Tibet was not part of China. So the battle lines were drawn. In October 1950, China invaded Tibet. Their soldiers crossed the border and attacked Chamdo. It's a city in eastern Tibet. You can't really call it a war because the Tibetans were totally outmatched. China's army had three million soldiers. Tibet's entire population was one million. So Chamdo was captured within days. It's around this time that the 14th Dalai Lama assumed political duties. That's the current one, the 14th. And he was just 15 years old at the time. The Tibetans could not leave their highest office empty. Not during a war. So the 15-year-old Lama took charge. After taking Chamdo, China hit the pause button. They knew the message had been delivered. If Tibet resisted, China would crush it. And that's why the Tibetan delegation went to Beijing to avoid the worst case scenario. And on paper, the 17 point agreement was very diplomatic. Tibet could have regional autonomy, the Dalai Lama's powers would be untouched, the Buddhist religion will be respected, and Lamas and monasteries will be protected. It does sound acceptable. But China did the exact opposite. Mao Zedong wasn't a liberal democrat. He was a hardcore communist of the 20th century. He did not just hate Buddhism, he hated all religions. So the 17-point agreement became a farce, a betrayal of the Tibetan people. Why did the Dalai Lama accept it? Let's not forget, he was just 15 years old at the time. Maybe his advisors suggested it. Maybe they believed that China would honor its word. In 1954, the Dalai Lama traveled to China. He stayed there for a year. He met with Mao and other Chinese leaders. For the young Dalai Lama, China was a wonderland. Cars, factories, shiny buildings, things he'd never seen before. He later talked about how surprised he was, how he liked Marxism, and how he wanted to join the Communist Party. But China had other plans. Mao's Marxism was brutal and authoritarian. He wanted uniformity, one nation, one culture, one language. So back in Tibet, there was discontent. People were unhappy with China's so-called reforms. They rebelled. Around this time, the Dalai Lama began his second foreign trip, this time to India. He met some Tibetan freedom fighters here. He talked to them. He understood their sentiments. And that's when the Dalai Lama realized what was happening, how his own people were suffocating under Chinese rule. He went back a changed man. Every rebellion needs a few key ingredients, leadership, a loyal population, and foreign support. Tibet had the first two, but not the last. The Dalai Lama hoped for support from India and Britain. Neither country helped. New Delhi kept diluting its Tibet policy and Britain was simply not interested. But one agency did help the Tibetans and that's the CIA, America's spy agency. They trained some Tibetan rebels until the 1960s or rather until it suited their interests. For now, back to our story. The Tibetan rebellion peaked in 1959. The reason was an invitation from China. A Chinese general invited the Dalai Lama to see a dance performance with one condition. He was asked to come without his bodyguards. Sounds fishy, right? The Tibetans thought so too. Rumors spread that China would arrest the Dalai Lama, so hundreds of people surrounded his palace, sort of like a human wall to protect him. By now, the picture was clear. China was losing patience with Tibet. Perhaps they wanted to capture the Dalai Lama, or worse. So a decision was made the Dalai Lama would flee Tibet. He disguised himself as a soldier, gathered his family and advisors and fled. They travelled only at night. For two weeks, no one knew where he was. Killed, captured or simply lost. Then on the 30th of March 1959, he re-emerged in India. He requested political asylum, which was granted. Back in Tibet, the Dalai Lama's decision was proven right. China slaughtered thousands of Tibetan soldiers, burned down monasteries, executed monks. It was ethnic cleansing. Seven decades later, the wounds are still fresh. The Dalai Lama is public enemy number one in China. He lives in India's Dharamshala. Tibetans are still treated as second-class citizens in China. Their culture is being wiped out. Their monasteries are targeted and their spiritual leader is called a separatist. Today, the world has largely forgotten Tibet. There is a Tibetan government in exile here in India, but the movement is losing steam. As long as the Dalai Lama is alive, people may remember it. But after that, he's 87 years old. So the question of succession remains. China wants to appoint its own. Will the Dalai Lama name a successor? So far, he's given mixed signals. Once he talked about ending the institution or appointing a woman Lama or maybe electing one. 
An entire generation of Tibetans is growing up outside their homeland. They've never seen Tibet. Maybe they never will. That is the legacy of China's invasion. They got the land, but not the people.